In the last lecture, we found out how the um, Kansas-Nebraska Act of uh, 1854 had pretty much um, destroyed the Whig Party, and out of it we saw the uh, rise of the Republican Party. Now keep in mind, we know that the Republican Party became sort of the vehicle for the anti-slavery movement, being that its uh, whole reason for being, its political platform, was no slavery in the Western territories. Okay, well, All of this leads us into the election of 1860, which is pretty much where we left off the last time, and we know that it was Abraham Lincoln that won that election. Now, in that respect, Abraham Lincoln's election demonstrates something to the South. Keep in mind, he's not even on the ballot in the South, let alone a real formidable candidate there. And he still managed to win the presidency without one single Southern vote. And so what this is demonstrating to the South, um, especially states like South Carolina that had really had, had, had been quite radical when it comes to saying if Lincoln was elected, then they would secede from the Union, it demonstrated that their way of life was more or less under fire. And so in the election of 1860, all eyes turn to South Carolina to see if they are going to make good on their promise to secede from the country. Now, South Carolina does secede from the Union, and the problem is Lincoln is not really there at the moment that they secede to really tell the country what will happen next. Now, keep in mind, when presidents are elected, it's not as if a day after the election they're taking the oath of office. Um, you're talking about months in between when they are elected and when they're actually becoming president of the United States. So what that means is the guy that's still president is our good friend James Buchanan. Now keep in mind, I told you that he was one of the worst presidents, maybe the worst president in American history. And one of the most important reasons why is he just completely washed his hands of the whole issue of secession. He's a lame duck. He knows that this is not his problem uh, a couple months down the road. So my point in this is he doesn't really do anything at all about South Carolina. He doesn't say, look, I completely support their decision to secede and they can do it. He doesn't say it's illegal to secede and they can't do it. I'm going to march in troops. He just doesn't say anything whatsoever. And so within a month after South Carolina seceding, uh, Florida, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, and Texas also issued ordinances of secession. Okay. Now, Buchanan's you know, refusal to really act, let alone act forcefully, uh, convinced other deep southern states that if South Carolina is going to do this and it's going to get away with it, then what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So in a way, he actually encouraged um, um, states to secede from the Union by not punishing South Carolina. Now, the issue of ordinances of secession. What an ordinance of secession actually is, is a formal declaration that this particular state is no longer a part of the United States, that they hereby officially dissolve their um, affiliation with the United States. Now, one thing I'd like you to be very, very mindful of when it comes to these initial ordinances of secession, slavery is built right into those ordinances. Uh, a very good case in point would be the Ordinance of Secession of Mississippi, which basically declares, I'm paraphrasing of course, but basically declares that Mississippi identifies itself within the interests of slavery. And it defines Abraham Lincoln and the kind of government that he's establishing, an anti-slavery government. So when it comes to why the South is seceding, at least the Deep South, and at least in the initial stages of secession, it's very clearly revolving around the issue of slavery. Okay. Now, even this late in the game, um, there are people that are desperately trying to save the Union, including one man uh, by the name of James C. Crittenridge. Okay? Now, Crittenridge had proposed a compromise that would take that Missouri Compromise line, the 30, 36-30th parallel, and move it all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Now, clearly the North would have an advantage when it comes to anything north of that line would go to a free state, and anything south of that line would become a slave state. But in order to appease the South, what it proposed was that any uh, in, in, eventual territories that would come under the dominion of the United States would be 
up for grabs when it comes to becoming a slave state. In other words, if we conquered Cuba, then we could export slavery onto the island nation of Cuba because clearly Cuba is south of Missouri's southern border. Abraham Lincoln rejects this, saying that what this would essentially do is unleash unrelenting war on the peoples of Central and South America, and that's probably pretty fair. If you add the incentive of expanding slavery, then there's no end in terms of how many slave states can be added if you think about all that territory in the Western Hemisphere that's south of Missouri. Um, the South also rejected it, and basically for reasons that water was already under the bridge when it comes to this issue of secession, uh, they had declared their independence and there was pretty much no going back. The main question at the time is, what are the northern parts of the South going to do? In other words, Virginia, Kentucky, Maryland, um, Tennessee, those were all states that were vitally important to both sides. And so what I'd like to talk about right now are the border states. Now when I say border states, I'm talking primarily about four states. I'm talking about Delaware and Maryland on the East Coast. Uh, both were slave states and both had southern interests. I'm talking about Kentucky and Missouri in the central part of the United States. Again, both of them are slave states. Abraham Lincoln felt that it was absolutely critical that those states not secede for, from the Union. Now, Delaware, in my own professional opinion, was not really in, ever, in any kind of real danger of issuing secession or issuing ordinances of secession. Um, Maryland is a little more tricky, but um, again, you, you never really have a really big question mark when it comes to Maryland. Now, don't get me wrong, Abraham Lincoln's very concerned, considering the, 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 the northern capital is right there in Washington, D.C., so had Maryland seceded, um, the capital basically would have been surrounded by enemy territory. But Maryland doesn't secede either. Now, the big question marks are going to be Missouri and Kentucky, so let's start with Kentucky. If you take a look at a map, Kentucky is right there in the central part of the United States, so it's very key to both battle plans, both north and south. Um, Abraham Lincoln felt that it was absolutely critical that, that Kentucky remain, at the very worst, neutral. In other words, never actually go on to support the Confederacy. Now, to that end, Lincoln can't make any wild sort of proclamations, including anything having to do with the institution of slavery. Keep in mind, Kentucky is a slave state, even though slavery had become more and more unpopular as we got closer to the Civil War. So Lincoln basically leaves Kentucky to its own devices. He doesn't really make any kind of wild promises, certainly doesn't anything, uh, do anything uh, controversial with respect to the institution of slavery, he more or less lets Kentuckians decide for themselves. And ultimately what Kentucky decides is that it will not secede from the Union. Now, it does send men and supplies to both the North and to the Confederacy, but as far as the state government in Kentucky is concerned, it never leaves the Union, which does mean that it's got members of Congress and senators still active in the whole process of governing. The same is true of Missouri. Now, just like Kentucky was very critical for a northern battle plan, Missouri is too, considering the largest river in North America, the Mississippi River, uh, basically goes right up and down the state of Missouri. And so, because Missouri was also a slave state, Lincoln takes a similar approach that he does in Kentucky in the sense that he never forces the issue. He certainly never goes ahead and says slavery would be forever illegal in Missouri because there was an anti-slavery movement in Missouri that was growing very similar to Kentucky. Really, slavery is most powerful of a social force in the Deep South where it's got such a huge special interest, where it's got such a huge connection to the economy. So, none of the four states that I mentioned, none of the border states, actually go ahead and officially secede, even though, like I said before, just about all of them send people and uh, certainly supplies to the Confederacy. Okay? Now, the Upper South, those would be the states of Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee. Now, there's a different story there, and it's a different story because very similar to a place like Kentucky, slavery wasn't nearly as powerful in Virginia as it was in a place like Mississippi, okay? 
Um, reason being is that Virginia's economy had changed and it no longer depended on slavery the same way that a state like Mississippi did. And so therefore, Virginia and those other states that I mentioned were far less inclined to go ahead and jump on the bandwagon when it comes to secession. It's actually going to take an act of war, at least what Virginia sees as an act of war, to pull Virginia into the fight. Now the reason that these four states are so critical to the Confederacy, to the South, is first of all, that's where the population is, right? Um, Two-thirds of the Southern population, this white population, resides in what we call the Upper South, so Arkansas, uh, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia. Um, without those four states, you really don't have much of a fighting chance when it comes to winning your independence. Furthermore, that's where the food is grown. You know, Missouri, excuse me, um, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, there's agriculture there, but it's not the kind of agriculture that you can sustain yourself upon. It's cotton. Um, so, you know, the production of corn and wheat and uh, pork and all the things that are essential to, you know, produce an army, um, th th those are not going to be something that you're going to see in the Deep South. So that's another reason why uh, choosing sides is critical here. Last, and certainly not least, the arsenals, the places where guns are manufactured, those are all in the Upper South. Um, the, the, the ability, what little bit there is, but the ability to produce in an industrial fashion, which is going to basically be a key factor in the North eventually winning the war, None of that is available in the Deep South. I mean, for the most part, it's not. And so you can see how and why the Upper South was so critical to the South's um, ability to, at the very least, wage the war. Now, what brought the Upper South in was uh, a perceived attack from the North. When Abraham Lincoln became president, or I guess I should say by the time he became president, there was one fortification, one fort, if you will, in the South, the Deep South, that had not been taken over by the Confederacy, and that would be Fort Sumter. It was right off the coast of South Carolina, and it was holding out. And it had basically been under siege for weeks before Lincoln had become president. And what Abraham Lincoln said was that the fort would surrender with honor um, a few days after he took care of business, so to speak, when it comes to sailing a ship in there to resupply the men, to provide medical supplies and to provide food. Well, the ship, of which Lincoln made very clear, was not armed. Um, the ship was fired upon by the powers that be in South Carolina. They considered that to be an attack on their sovereign territory. And therefore, it's Fort Sumter that actually begins the process of the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln, for his part, is able to cite an actual attack on what he considers to be American soil, so he goes ahead and he cites the Force Bill of 1833, uh, bringing the country into war. Now, as far as Virginia and the other states that I mentioned in the Upper South were concerned, this was the North being an aggressor. As far as somebody like Virginia was concerned, then the North knew what was going to happen if it put a ship, a warship, in South, uh, off the coast of South Carolina. And so therefore, as far as Virginia was concerned, this was a situation where there's no more questions that we can ask. You've got an abusive, tyrannical government as far as they're concerned. And so in Virginia, North Carolina, Arkansas, and Tennessee, it's less and less about slavery, those ordinances of secession, and more and more about a worry, a concern, that if what's happening in South Carolina is applied to the general population, pretty soon, as far as they're concerned, you're looking at an abusive, potentially tyrannical federal government that the South could no longer live with. Okay? So anyway, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the sides of the Civil War and their objectives. For the most part, what I'd like you to understand is the north would be everything north of, let's call it Kentucky, so Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, New York, Massachusetts. Um, that would be, uh, uh, the, the main army would be the Army of the Potomac, and that would be what I would, cons would frequently refer to as the Union Army or the Northern Army. The south would be considered the Confederacy. Um, after Virginia and company decide to secede, 
Uh, what the southern states do is they put together a loose affiliation that they call the Confederate States of America, the CSA. Now, Confederate, if you think about that word, Articles of Confederation, loose and weak federal government, um, that was basically the premise of southern government, considering what they were walking away from was what they considered to be too much centralized power. And, of course, they were very concerned over what would happen with the institution of slavery. Okay, Now, the South is uh, led by a man from Mississippi, a guy by the name of Jefferson Davis. And Jefferson Davis makes it very clear that his goal is not to conquer anything. His goal is not that much different than the Americans in the American Revolution. It's just to be left alone. Okay. Now, um, that being said, what he's primarily trying to do is bring in another big country, um, maybe France, but certainly Great Britain, because both of those countries depend on the South for their cotton, for their textile industries. But what he wants to try to do is present the South's goals and objectives as something that was relatively benign and relatively, um, I guess you could say, I mean, certainly we wouldn't see it as such, but um, noble in a sense, that uh, this was a big federal government trying to tell an unoffending people how to live, and that was their cause. Now, for all the disadvantages that the South has, and there's a lot, um, the weapons are manufactured in the North, the North has more people, um, you know, the, the North has a central government that's up teen times more capable of governing during wartime because it's stronger. The one advantage that the South has is it doesn't have to necessarily win the war, it just has to avoid losing it. It's very similar to the American Revolution. As long as we can avoid Washington being captured, meaning George Washington, and his armies being completely crushed, we had a fighting chance. Well, that was the South's um, situation in 1861. Uh, now, the North's goal, and I want to be very clear about this because Lincoln takes every precaution to point this out, the North's goal is to simply preserve the Union. You heard me right. It's got nothing to do with slavery, at least not in 1861. As far as Abraham Lincoln is concerned, secession is illegal. There's nothing in the Constitution that allows the South to do this, and so what he's doing is preserving the Union and bringing the South back into the country. That is the North's goal. That's what Abraham Lincoln tells the country that he's doing. Now, that will change in due time, but for right now, I need you to understand that on a very direct level. Now, as far as the war itself is concerned, both sides assumed that this was going to be a short fight. And the initial battle of the war, the Battle of Bull's Run, demonstrates that it will not be a short fight, not by any stretch of the imagination. Bull's Run is a very clear victory for the Confederacy. Okay, And what it does is it kind of sets off um, a wave of victories for the North, or excuse me, for the South, especially in the East. So Virginia, um, uh, 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 later on in the war, uh, Maryland, um, those are going to be places that the, the Confederacy is riding on high tide, okay? Now, in the West, it's really going to be where we begin to see more and more of the northern victories that will be particularly important. But there's one battle, I'm not a huge battle kind of guy, but there's one battle that I would like you to be mindful of, and that would be the Battle of Antietam. Now, Antietam is in Maryland, and the guy that by 1862 is in command of the Army of Northern Virginia, that would be the Confederacy, that would be a guy from Virginia by the name of Robert E. Lee. Lee's decision to go into Maryland is essentially his decision to go on the offensive. In other words, the South is not fighting this defensive war. It's actually trying to capture Washington and force the issue with Lincoln's government directly. Okay. Now, Antietam is essentially a draw. No side can really claim victory, although Abraham Lincoln clearly tries to claim victory. Now, why is he trying to do this? Well, you know, any wartime president is in a really big predicament when it comes to public opinion. If the war is going well, then he's a very popular president, a very capable commander-in-chief. If the war is not going well, then that has political consequences. And things being as they are, meaning the future course of the United States, will it look like it looks today, is very much in question in 1862. 
And so Lincoln is trying to find a military victory to hang his hat upon because he understands that these losses are going to have uh, political consequences. So even though for all intents and purposes Antietam is a draw, Lincoln plays it off as a victory. Now, all that being said, uh, it's my opinion that the war was ultimately won in the West, okay? In the West, what you have is a guy by the name of Ulysses S. Grant, and you'll hear more and more of him as our class unfolds. But Grant is able to maneuver the Northern armies in a way that he's able to win several very key uh, military victories early on in the war. For instance, at Fort Henry and at Fort Donelson in Tennessee, uh, Grant is able to secure those victories. And what that does is it basically, um, uh, it basically cedes Tennessee, gives Tennessee to control of the North. So as I mentioned before, Tennessee was a very important state for the Confederacy. And very early on in the war, Tennessee's out of the fight. Uh, a little bit later, the city of New Orleans had fallen into control of the Federals, or to the North. Uh, New Orleans was not only the financial capital of the Confederacies, where the money was, it was also the largest city. Um, but really, it's the Battle of Shiloh that is a very decisive turning point in the western part of the Civil War. Now, what I'd like you to know about the Battle of Shiloh is that it was an unmistakable northern victory. And even though it doesn't get a lot of press in the papers, and Abraham Lincoln's not able to make such a big deal out of it, it's really going to be critical to the eventual success that the North would have later on in the Civil War. The reason being is it's a beginning step toward cutting the Confederacy in two. In other words, what's happening here is Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas are going to be less and less capable, really Mississippi too, less and less capable after the Battle of Shiloh of participating in the war simply because the North is going to occupy the Mississippi River. And that being the case, it's going to make sure that those states can't send men or supplies to those armies in the East. So we're getting to a point, 1863 and forward, we're getting to a point where Lee can win battle after battle after battle, and it's not really as effective as you might assume it would be. Um, the North is able to absorb a lot of those losses simply because they've got a numerical advantage. There's more people that live there, so the more people that die, yes, that's bad, but it's not as critical as it is in the South, right? Furthermore, we've reached a point in, in military history where we're getting into a modern war, modern types of war. Meaning that if you can't clothe, equip, and feed your armies, it really doesn't matter how many victories that you win, ultimately you're going to run out of gas. Now, that leads me to another point. Um, the Civil War is the first modern war. A lot of people consider uh, it to be the first modern war in human history. And it's also the first total war, okay? Meaning that every aspect of the society is being pitted against the society that you're at war against. So you need infrastructure, you need things to be able to fight this war. And one of the most important things that you need are people. Now it's infinitely easier to fight a war when you've got a stronger central government simply because um, you're able to mandate policy. And so one of the things that you see in the North is Abraham Lincoln implementing a draft. Every man from 18 to 35 was eligible to be forced into the military, even if they didn't want to. Now, in places like New York, this sets off a series of violent riots, um, um, and, and they, there's clear racial overtones to them, um, especially in the working-class Irish districts. And so Lincoln actually goes so far as to suspend habeas corpus. Um, this is the provision, constitutional provision, that provides for a fair and fast trial if the government has arrested you. Basically what I'm saying here is if Abraham Lincoln doesn't like the look on your face in New York or anywhere else for that matter, he can throw you in prison for the duration of the war even longer than that if he wants to. Um, another few things that I'd like you to be mindful of when it comes to this issue of total war is the, um, uh, is the uh, Legal Tender Act of 1862. Um, together with the Conscription Act, uh, also issued in 1862, the, the, the law that gives rise to the draft, uh, the Legal Tender Act basically provides for an income tax. 
For the first time in American history, the federal government will tax the incomes of people uh, of the North, and this is a way to fund the war. Now, the reason this is such an important aspect of the war is if you don't have any money, you don't have any guns, and if you don't have any guns, you don't have the ability to make war. Well, the South doesn't have that. Basically, the only thing that the South can do when it comes to funding this war is to basically issue an IOU. I'm indebted to you. And so what you see happening in the South is massive rates of inflation, and the South is running out of money very, very quickly. And by the later stages of the war, 1864 and especially 1865, it can't afford to feed or clothe its armies any longer. And so even though it probably wins more battles and it certainly loses fewer people, um, it's really not in a position to win this war, so to speak. You'll understand what I'm talking about a little bit better the next time when we talk about the end of the Civil War.